Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Vanshika, and I'm from Desh Bandur College. The topic of my presentation is Drosophila melanogaster, fly that unfold genetics. The conceptual and the experimental framework of the controlled mating of the model organism for genetic analysis has begun with the Gregor Mendel in 1865, but it was not fully appreciated until Thomas Morgan started his pioneering work for Drosophila in 1908. With the availability of the complete genome sequence for Drosophila, it has facilitated the rapid characterization of genes, application of the classic genetic methodologies, mating schemes, genetic screening, and it is continuing till now. The continuity, uh, the uh, popularity of the Drosophila is primarily due to the available of rich resources. Also, its amenability to forward genetic screening and analysis. As we all know, in the diploid organism, all the chromosomes except the sex chromosomes are paired. One is being contributed by the father, another by the mother. The two members of a pair are called homologous chromosome. An individual is either homozygous if the same allele is present at the same locus, or it could be heterozygous if alleles on the homologous chromosomes are different. Now the fly with the normal wing is generally referred as a wild type. It could be homozygous. That means it could have the plus plus gene at both the locus, at both the, at both the chromosome at the same locus. That means the plus gene for the wing character is dominant. The recessive character for the wing is vestigial, which we have already seen. It is a mutation. So the fly for a plus character, that is a wild type character, could either be homozygous, that is the plus plus, or at both the positions, or it could be plus and VG. That is, it would have the heterozygous condition also. So VG is recessive and plus is dominant. So what we can do is to analyze the dominant versus recessive alleles, we can put a cross. A cross involves only one character or a trait at a time is known as monohybrid cross. If we, if we are studying the dihybrid cross, then we are studying the inheritance of two different characters. Mendel has postulated the law of segregation and independent assortment, which provides the chromosomal basis of inheritance. So let's see what Mendel's law states. First important fact that the genetic characters are controlled by unit factors existing in pairs or in uh, pairs in the individual organisms. Another fact is of dominant versus recessive. When two unlike unit factors are responsible for the single character in individual, one unit factor is dominant to another and that is going to be visualized as a phenotype. Other would be recessive. Then comes the segregation. During the formation of gametes, the paired unit factors separate or segregate randomly so that each gamete receives one or the other with an equal likelihood. The last fact is independent assortment. That is, during the gamete formation, the segregating pairs of unit factors assort independently of each other. So, because the uh, Drosophila is commonly used to verify the Mendelian laws, we can also use the Drosophila to actually see uh, the characters are following the Mendelian laws or not. So, for that, we have to put the crosses. There are some requirements prior, uh, prior to the process. Now, what are those requirements? Step one is securing the bulging genes. 
Now, uh, we know that uh, many experiments uh, in the Drosophila will require the process between the males and the females, specifically for the desired genotype. Because uh, it is common uh, phenomenon in many insects, Drosophila females also store the sperms transferred during the mating in their spermatica. And they can use that sperm for the lifelong. Therefore, by putting the process, it becomes very imperative that we should always uh, start with the unmated flies. We should always start with the unmated female flies because those flies would not have any predisposition of genetic material. We have to start fresh. So this, uh, this involves the securing of the virgin flies. And we can secure the virgin flies uh, by the methods like uh, we can uh, select the adult uh, flies also that would be virgin. So we know that uh, it is a uh, we already know that after the eclosion the flies remain the female flies specifically they are going to remain virgin for at least about eight hours. So at that uh, within that time span if we able to segregate the males and the females that we can, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so that window is very important. Also, uh, we have to observe the uh, virgin flies under the microscope very carefully because any virgin fly, whether it is a male or a female, would have the presence of a meconium. Meconium is a, uh, is a, a spot over the ventral side of the uh, fly. Uh, which is formed because of the presence of the undigested food. It is also present in males. But uh, if we are looking for the virgin females, then we have to look for the meconia as well as for the other female features, which we have already discussed. Another method by which we can secure the virgin females is by segregating male and female pupa from the culture wire. So mature pupa are taken on the glass light uh, and uh, with the drop of the water, we are going to analyze that, uh, we are going to analyze uh, the pupa under the microscope. So we can use a stereo microscope or by a stereo binocular microscope for that. Their legs can be seen through semi-transparent pupal gills. Those pupa which lack the sex cones, they could be, they are definitely the uh, fly, uh, female flies. And, they, uh, and at the level of pupa only, we can able to sort the male and the female by looking at the six points. Now, what is the journal methodology of putting the process? If you are starting with any character which we want to study, first we have to take the virgin females and the males. And uh, the character has to be on any of the pairs which we want to study. Now, uh, we, as we are starting with the parents, we have to take some number with them. For the first tube, like for the starting culture, we can put the six virgin flies uh, with respect to the four uh, male flies. And we can allow them to mate. We know that the eggs are going to appear within one day if the mating has happened. So uh, with the starting of one tube, that will not give us a significant number of the population, which can be analyzed statistically. So we have to set up the multiple crosses uh, of the same experiment. So for that, we also require the multiple virgin females fly, which is a very tedious work. So what we can do is, we can transfer the same parent into multiple tubes with the gap of one day because we know that in one day the eggs are being already laid in the tubes so after a day we are going to transfer the same parent parents into the fresh tube and we keep on transferring them till we achieve a significant number of tubes and after the mating has been done these tubes are ready for F1 generation because uh, eggs are being already laid. 
Now, when the F1 generation is going to appear after like 10 days, we allow them to self-mate together. Okay, we will not collect the virgin flies again for the F1 into F1 mating. We allow them to self-mate. So now here, the F1 into F1, that is self-mating is being done, although the number would be definite. We are going to six, uh, uh, we are going to take the six females versus four males. Uh, we do not want overcrowding in our team. So we are going to take six male, uh, six females and four males per tube. We can set up multiple crosses for F1, self -aid. Or we can also transfer the F1 parents into the, uh, into the different tubes. Uh, similarly, what we have done for the P1 into P2 case. And then after five to seven days, the F2 generation will arrive. Uh, now we have to analyze the F2 generation here because uh, we have to calculate the ratio and we have to analyze whether the independent assortment has occurred or not. So for analyzing the ratio, we have to discard the parent. We do not want a parent to mate indefinitely. And uh, we also do not want the parent genotypes and the phenotypes to be counted within the project. We are going to discard the parents and we will analyze the F2 progeny for the examination of the phenotypes. The F2 flies, which are collected, they are going to be counted and their data will be tabulated properly. We are going to record the interpretations of the data and then based on that data, we are going to perform a statistical analysis. This statistical analysis is done to determine if the inheritance of a mutant phenotype follows the law of independent assortment and the allele is located on autosome or on X chromosome. So this data will give us the idea about that. So let's start with the example that uh, we want to study the demonstr uh, uh, we want to study the law of segregation and we want to demonstrate using the drosophila mutants. We know that drosophila has eight chromosomes. So four pair of chromosomes are present in the somatic cells of the drosophila. Males and females are going to differ in their sex chromosome pair. Two X chromosomes are present in female, whereas one X and one Y is going to be present in male. Autosomes are commonly present. So the genes which are located on X chromosome, they are sex linked and genes which are uh, located on autosomes, they are autosomal linked. Both the genes, whether they are sex linked or autosomal genes, are going to uh, exhibit the different patterns of inheritance. So this the difference in the pattern of inheritance can be uh, studied when we put the homo uh, monohybrid cross uh, of the of the uh, phenotype, of the mutant, of the genes which we are basically studying. So in a typical monohybrid cross, we can put two crosses. One cross is uh, a wild type. Basically what we do in the cross, what uh, we are going to cross the wild type with the mutant. And we are going to put the two crosses in which one, in the first cross, we are going to take the wild type females which are crossed with the mutant males and we can in the second cross we are going to put the reciprocal cross in which the male would be wild type and the female would be mutant. So here uh, the demonstration of the law of segregation is done by using a drosophila mutant which is having a mutation in the wing character. Here I am taking we are taking we are studying vestigial wing mutant and we are taking the vestigial wing character, both in males and in the reciprocal cross in the females. So uh, like, uh, what we have discussed in the strategy, first we are going to cross the parents uh, for both the crosses. So here, when we are taking the wild type females, they have to be virgin, and we are taking the mutant males. So mutant males are going to produce the gametes, VGVG, 
and the females are going to produce the gamete BG plus BG plus. And their combination, possible for combination would be BG plus BG, BG plus BG, BG plus BG, BG plus BG. BG, BG. So here in the F1 generation, if you see the genotype and the phenotype here, uh, the phenotype would be all the progeny irrespective of male and female. They are going to have a wildlife character. They, have, they are going to have a normal way. So uh, now it's a time. And now we get the F1 generation. Now it's a time for selfing for F1 generation. So here, uh, as you already know, that uh, there is no uh, virgin fly collection required. So what we are going to do? We are going to take uh, BG plus BG and another one BG plus BG female. We are going to take and one BG plus BG male. We are going to take because or to koi because. Uh, uh, so, but, uh, they are going to produce the uh, 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 gametes BG plus BG and BG plus BG and then the plausible combination of the offspring with the genotypes would be the BG plus BG plus BG plus BG 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 plus and BG BG. So in the F2 generation for this monohybrid cross, we will see that uh, three progeny out of four would be having a wild-type character of Weng and one progeny is going to have uh, the mutant character of Weng. This mutant character could be in the males or it, it could be in the females. So for a typical monohybrid cross, if we study uh, he, uh, for the vestigial allele, it has been seen that a normal wing size is dominant over the recessive one, that is the vestigial allele. And it follows uh, the law of independent assortment also and segregation also that the ratio has been seen as three is to one. So this is what is expected if the character is controlled by one gene and this also illustrates the Mendelian law of segregation which means that the genes or alleles uh, which are present in the F1 will not going to blend or contaminate with the other. Rather they are going to segregate in their pure form in which they have arrived from the parents. So this is a typical Mendelian ratio which we have to observe. Also, if you see for the reciprocal cross, when you put the reciprocal cross in which you are going to take um, BG plus BG plus as males and BG BG as females, the results are going to be same. Basically, there is no difference between the results of this cross and with its reciprocal cross. Both the, uh, both the crosses are going to show three is to one ratio only. And if both the main cross and the reciprocal cross is going to show the same ratio, this suggests that a particular mutation in the gene is located on autosomes. The, the BG mutation is located on the autosomes. So when we collect the F2 flies, we do the counting of the F2 flies, we are going to calculate the ratio, we are going to record the phenotypic ratio of all the crosses, uh, and then we are going to perform the appropriate statistical test. Now the purpose of this test is to test whether the observed ratio fits into the expected ratio calculated based on the hypothesis. So here we have made a hypothesis that if we are getting three to one ratio, that means uh, the genes are showing the Mendelian inheritance, the pattern of inher inheritance is being following the Mendelian laws. That is uh, BG plus is a dominant character and the characters are independently assorted by the gamete formation. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so the expected ratio in the F2 has to be 3 is to 1. Virtually, uh, we, uh, 
uh, virtually for every uh, every genetics experiment when we are putting the crosses we have to do the statistical analysis and uh, the most commonly used statistical analysis is the chi square test this chi square test will help us to know whether the difference between the observed and the expected ratio is statistically significant or not if the difference is not significant at all that means any deviation between the observed and expected number is uh, is by chance and that can be ignored but if the difference between if uh, if the difference between the observed value and the expected value is too large that could not be ignored at all our test fail at that time and we have to check whether we have done any kind of uh, errors in our experiment might be we have to repeat our experiment and even after the repeating of experiments if there are no change in results so it uh, it suggests that the data doesn't fit to our hypothesis that is uh, this data doesn't uh, follow the mendelian uh, law of independent assault and then the results has to be interpreted uh, with some other hypothesis so chi square test is a very very important test to decide uh, whether uh, whether our uh, hypothesis is valid or not now another example is if the genes lie on sex chromosome that is if the genes are x linked so we can also demonstrate the law of segregation uh, using the drosophila mutants or not yes we can uh, we have to perform the crosses in the similar way we have to take a wild type phenotype in any of the parent and we also have to take a mutant uh, phenotype so we also going to put two crosses one would be the main cross and one would be the reciprocal cross in the in the first cross we are going to take the wild type phenotype in females in uh, the reciprocal cross we are going to take wild type phenotype in the males so the gene which we are studied uh, studying here is the uh, x linked gene that is the gene uh, of the eye color uh white eye mutant was the first mutant which was discovered by morgan and it is uh, basically uh, on the x chromosome uh, the gene is x linked gene. so we have to take the wild type uh, phenotype in females uh, which would be the red eye so we are denoting the red eyed females to be xr xr and we are crossing up with the white eye male uh, so it would be xw because it is white eyed and males are going to have y chromosome so in the first cross what we have done we have taken the gametes from the females and the males and uh, they are being mated randomly and uh, the progeny are being uh, having these probable genotypes so this would be female with a red eye character this would be again a female with a red eye character this would be male with a red eye character this would be male again with a red eye character so your f1 generation would have equal proportions of male and female with red eye character so now f1 selfing would be done so here what we take here uh, we are going to take this female and we are going to cross with this male because other genotype are also same so when we do the f1 selfing we observed uh, that uh, we are uh, getting a red eye female in the 50% ratio and we are getting uh, one red eye male and uh, one white eyed male and one red eye so the uh, phenotypic ratio would be for the red eye female among the four progeny the red eye female would be 2 red eye male would be 1 and white eye male would be 1 so in this cross red eye and white eye female when we are crossing white eye males when we are crossing in the f2 generation all the females are going to be red eye while 50% of the males are going to be red eye and 50% are going to be white eye so what we are getting we are getting 1 is 2 2 is 2 1 
ratio if we are segregating on the basis of eye color as well as sex of the group. Let's see for its reciprocal cross. Now, when we do the reciprocal cross here, uh, that means we are taking the female as the mutant allele, a mutant female, and we are taking the normal male with the red eye color. So in the F1 gener generation, if we see all the females are going to be red eyed and uh, male are going to be white eyed. And, we, and when we do the F1 selfing here, so we are going to observe females as white eye also and red eye also. And we are going to observe the males as red eye and white eye. So we are going to observe all types of phenotype with the equal proportions. So this pattern uh, suggests that there is a difference between the two crosses. One is to two is to one comparative, comparing with one is to one is to one is to one. So both the crosses have the different phenotypic ratios. So this pattern of transmission of character is explaining uh, a sex link pattern of inheritance. Also, when you, if you see here, like if we are taking a female as a white eye, here all the males are white eye. So it is a kind of a crisscross inheritance, which is seen only in the genes which are excellent. So yes, the eye character, the white eye mutant character is on X chromosome. Now it is a uh, now uh, there is a very interesting tool to study the genetic process in Drosophila. Uh, this is a Drosophila genetic simulation. This uh, uh, online simulator is being developed by University of Wisconsin Medicine. And uh, this simulator allows the students to perform the virtual test crosses with the model organism. Instructor here can uh, set the parameters for the population under the study, such as number and type of the traits in the population, modes of inheritance, trait linkage, etc. Student can determine which crosses to be performed and interpret the result. Uh, a result in the form of numbers. This simulator can also be used as a primary laboratory module for instructing biology or genetic courses or as a supplement to hands-on genetic module with the real organs. Because you know that it is a time of pandemic and students can't have an access to the Drosophila labs right now. So they can study the crosses on the stimulus. A simulator. So this simulator you can visit uh, at this website and this would be very, very helpful. Another aspect of the Drosophila as a model organism is observation of a higher order structure from higher order structures of chromatin. Now Drosophila melanogaster has a huge or what we say a giant chromosome in the salivary gland during the third instar stage. This is known as polydene chromosome. This is a preparation of a polydene chromosome by one of my students in the Deshpandu College. And you can see here a very beautiful display of polydene chromosome from the Drosophila larvae. Now, polydene chromosome have been widely used in variety of a genetic, cytogenetic, and molecular studies on gene expression. These chromosomes remain in a permanent interface, but due to the repetitive endoduplication cycles and tight lateral association of all the daughter chromatids, each chromosome become thicker and uh, distinctly visible under the light microscope. We can able to see the darkly stained regions and the lightly stained regions, which are also known as bands and interbands. Polydene chromosome is commonly observed in all diptelians, like Drosophila is one of them. Another source is Chironomus larva. Some mosquito also shows uh, the presence of a polydene. Apart from these diptherians, uh, 
polygene chromosomes are also being observed in some cereals and uh, also in some plant tissues. Now, uh, salivary glands of the third instar larva of the Drosophila is a uh, is an excellent uh, uh, source of kind uh, source of polygene. Uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, it is it is an excellent source of the polygene spreads due to the high level of the polytony which is achieved in the tissue. Uh, as we know that larva are basically food eaters in the whole of the uh, whole of the life cycle of Drosophila. So when they are going to eat too much, obviously to digest that food, they require large amount of enzymes. And um, due to uh, such a, you know, hoarding, uh, yeah, eating habits of uh, the uh, larvae, the size of the salivary gland also increases. All the resulting chromatids which are seen here, they remain, they maintain their lateral association in such a way that they are differentially coiled. And they also remain in their full length. So, uh, they, they result uh, in a, character, a characteristic pattern of like coiling. So if you see here, this is the chromosome number three, the right arm. This is the X chromosome. This is the uh, second chromosome. This is the left arm of the chromosome number three. This is the fourth chromosome. And all of them are joined at one point, which is known as chromocenter. All the chromosomes are being seen with alternatively light bands and the dark bands. The interbands are going to be light, in, uh, light with stain and uh, the bands uh, which are darkly stained, they are the regions of heterochromatic. So uh, the transcriptionally active regions uh, uh, can be seen under the microscope. You can able to see some of the opened area which are transcriptionally active and these regions are known as puffs. Puffs uh, are uh, basically accumulates the newly synthesized RNA because they are actually the uh, actively transcribing regions. But if you see the mitotic uh, dividing cell of the Drosophila, uh, the size of the chromosome is quite sm uh, small, whereas this polytene is very, very large. Now, if you see that uh, each chromosome uh, arm of the polytene is going to have a characteristic banding pattern due to which each region of the chromosome can be easily distinguished and identified. Every band here gives a specific number and identity. So uh, a physical map of the Drosophila polygene chromosome was being initially developed by uh, Calvin Bridge and uh, P. N. Bridge in 1930s and 40s respectively. And uh, they have observed approximately around 5,000 bands. And uh, this study has given the first physical map of any chromosome. Now later by, um, by the Sorsa group, uh, uh, with, the, with the advent of uh, the transmission electron microscopic image of these polygene chromosomes, they also developed the physical map of the polygene chromosome from the Drosophila. And what they have seen that the cytological map, which was developed by Bridges, that Thing extra could be uh, identified from the from the uh, from the transmission electron microscopic image. That means in the 1930s also the bridges have uh, bridges have done an uh, excellent work in uh, giving the physical map of the polygene chromosome with such an accuracy and details. Now, this physical map is uh, available on the online repository of the Drosophila. That is the fly base. Now, how we can, uh, uh, you know, prepare the temporary mount of uh, polygene chromosome. For that, we need to dissect the third instar larva. 
as we know that third install lava is uh, clearly visible it's because of its size it is big in size as compared to the rest of the lava like first in star and second in star and we can easily observe this is a mouth part and this is the body cavity and all so uh, we can take out some of the healthy lavas from the culture vials and we can dip them into a phosphate buffer saline solution so that the extra food which is being stick to these lavas they can be you know get it cleaned after the lavas are being cleaned they are being taken over the slide and uh, they are being pulled properly with a needle in the, at the middle uh, of the uh, lava body and uh, a forcep which is you know holding the mouth region and we have to tease the mouth region gently so that the whole of the body cavity comes out when whole of the body cavity comes out the salivary gland are going to be you know extracted out which appears you know very shiny white in color you can do the dissection under the binocular microscope and uh, that is the studio microscope very easily under the 4x magnification they are very well uh, um, visualized under the 4x magnification after the extraction of the uh, salivary glands uh, this is the fat body which is need to be removed but uh, it has to be taken care that uh, while removing this fat body we should not throw out the salivary gland so if you are uh, uh, you know ex have an expertise enough to identify the salivary gland only then you clean the fat body otherwise it is not necessary to clean the fat body because it is not going to hinder the preparations of the polyp so uh, after the extraction of the salivary glands we are going to perform the staining procedures so uh, after cleaning of the salivary glands we are going to uh, fix the tissue into a fixative here the fixative which we are using is acetometanol uh, after the fixation for about 1 minute uh, then we are going to put two to three drops of acetocarmine stain um, For, for the staining purpose and we are not letting our slide to dry if we observe that our slide is drying uh, so we are going to put more stain so drying should not happen after the staining procedure is over uh, for about 5 minutes then we squash the tissue now squashing is a very very important step and it is a key step so first we are going to uh, put the cover slip over the stained uh, um, stained tissue and then we are going to squash by providing the optimal thumb pressure and now what is the definition of optimal thumb pressure we have to learn through our experience only ideally the thumb pressure would be well enough that it should not break your slide after putting the thumb pressure only once then we are going to tap uh, tap uh, the slide tap the cover slip using the blunt end of the pencil squashing has to be very very gentle using the pencil so after the squashing is over the tissue is being observed under the 10x focused more on 40x and lately when we observe the polyteen chromosome in 100x using oil emulsion we are going to observe the polyteen chromosome it is the most beautiful uh, slide preparations uh, of the polyteen chromosome in which a coiled coil structure is being properly seen along with the transcription uh, along with the bands and the interbands and we can also see uh, if you if you can focus here we can also see see the puffs so it is a very beautiful preparation and if you do, uh, do it very carefully you can observe it also in your life. so uh this is all about the polyteen uh, polyteen chromosomes
Now, another aspect of using this model organism at the undergraduate level is we can design small, small projects for the students. Like uh, one of the idea of the project is to test the pharmacolog uh, pharmacological properties of the plants, plant-based products. This can be easily done by botany student or a zoology student or any licensed student. As we know that the fly genome is about 180 megabase pairs in size and it is fully sequenced. Uh, it code about 14,000 uh, genes, uh, which is you know very much comparable to the human genes, which uh, human genes which are being about 30,000. The genome sequences of the fly and uh, uh, we have seen that it shows about 75% similarity with the disease-related genes in humans. Thus, it is, uh, it is giving us a great potential to be used as a human disease model. We can use the uh, disease models of the fly, which can easily fed on the diet mixture, uh, which we will provide. This diet mixture can be supplemented by the plant or the plant derived components. And we can study the effect of the targeted compounds uh, using, uh, using uh, like observing any kind of a phenotypic change, like um, any eye anomaly could be there. There could be changes in uh, the developmental uh, format, like the life cycle, they could be shortened or it could be uh, the longevity of the life uh, cycle can be increased. The lifespan can be increased. There could be difference in the fecundity rates also. Uh, there could be difference in the developmental stages like larva, pupa, adult and all. Or there could be differences in the behavior of the flies also like the locomotion can be impaired or it can be more activated the climbing phenomena can be impaired phototaxic phenomena can be impaired and all so drosophila has uh, significantly contributed to the understanding of the neurobiology as it possesses a very complex nervous system as that of the higher organism so it is a perfect model to study the neurogenerative diseases because it provides a, a genetic mo modifier screenings to identify the novel genes function in, uh, in, in related to the diseases, uh, which could be uh, in the signaling pathways also. Uh, scientists have developed the Alzheimer model of the Drosophila and uh, uh, the pathogenesis of the Alzheimer, Alzheimer disease has been shown to be related with the amyloid precursor protein-like and the tau protein-like toxicity effects, such as accumulation of uh, uh, AB42 plaques and the formation of neurofibrillary tangles similar to that of humans. Now, the generation of the transgenic flies, which overexpress or downexpress the gene of interest. Uh, in the whole of the body or in the specific tissues are possible by uh, using the UAS GAL4 binary expression system. So we can also create the no knockdowns of the drosophila by uh, using uh, the RNA interference technique, which will help us to understand the specific gene function. Drosophila has also been used as a vulnerable model system for developmental and genetic studies. Survivorship, cuparition, and developmental toxicity, uh, toxicity assays can be easily performed for developmental studies of the fly. These assays will help us to assess the effect of any plant compound, drugs, medicines, toxins in vivo on the development of the food fly. So if we are, uh, studying uh, any kind of a plant-based uh, plant product as a supplement, we can perform different assays here. Like we can perform the development assays or the, uh, in, that, in that we can also perform the behavior assay, biochemical assay, cell death assay. So in the developmental assay, we can uh, do the survivorship assay. This assay is very helpful in search of a life extension activity associated with the plant-derived components. Flies or the larvas can be supplemented with the desired plant-derived components 
in the uh, with their regular uh, which is mixed with their regular food and uh, the extension in the survival will be uh, will be suggesting the life extension activity of that component several research reports are being uh, published uh, for wheat grass curcumin apple even and uh, it has been seen that all extracts of all these plants increases the survival and the health span in the rice since uh, we know that drosophila is holometabolous insect it has a proper life cycle showing the different stages like larva pupa adult during their developmental cycle so it is a best model to study the developmental toxicity levels if we uh, if we uh, supplement uh, the plant derived component with their normal diet as a mixed food so the toxicity can be studied so it uh, various reports are being there which shows that uh, the supplementation of vinsa rosea leaf extract and the hexane food extract of ostrogia limbata has adverse effect on the fly development and it suggested that it has a bio insecticidal activity associated with it so some some of the plant derived products could be insecticidal also and some could be uh, increasing the life span and the development uh, and in, uh, increases the development stages of the life cycle now we come to the behavioral assay now um, feeding and the gustatory behavior assays are very important uh, <clears throat> because uh, these assays uh, have a proper signaling and molecular mechanism which can be correlated with the feeding behavior of the flies now feeding the plant extract with this uh, mixed diet uh, is a very simple and effortless process we can easily do it and then <clears throat> uh, then uh, they can be allowed to feed on a food mixed diet the larvas and uh, we can find out the formal uh, pharmacological properties also the feeding behavior is appropriate behavioral response against supplementation and uh, for the feeding behavior assays uh, we can uh, confirm any changes in the phenotype uh, which can be seen in the diseased fly especially uh, that they have been recovered from that disease or uh, they uh, they are properly feeding on the food or not which they would have not done in the control hours other behavior behavioral assays which can be done is uh, any changes in the environmental or the ecological factors can uh, change the behavior of the of these insects so uh, it also relies on the genetic makeup of the organism and it is connective link between the molecular and the physiological prospect of the biology and ecological ecological changes so any changes in the locomotion activity is more studied in this uh, animal uh, because uh, basically it is uh, associated with certain kind of a genetic diseases in the disease con disease condition of the fly if we are studying the neurological disorders like alzheimer disease or parkinson disease then also the motor functions are going to be impaired and we are assessing these fly on the locomotion locomotive activity so only so the effect of any plant derived component on the locomotive behavior of the flies can be performed and uh, the crawling lay, uh, crawling rate of the larva and the adult flies can be assayed another assay which is available is the biochemical assay now biochemical assay involves the uh, assay of the enzymes such as superoxide dimutase catalase glutathione par oxidase glutathione uh, glutathione s transferase uh, they are popularly done in this flies and they are associated to examine the antioxidant potential associated with the selected plant derived 
selected with the plant derived components so if the plants um, basically if we are studying the plants for a uh, aging phenomena like uh, they can act as an anti aging products so we have to perform these antioxidant activities of the enzyme because uh, uh, for any kind of oxidative stress which has been observed in the cell uh, the activity of these enzymes are going to be modulated because uh, drosophila is a very very you know robust uh, model organism which can be used for assessing uh, the antioxidant activity of these enzyme like sod cad gpx so we can examine the uh, mixed diet form a mixed effect of the mixed diet with the assay of this enzyme and uh, we can able to surely tell whether the plant based component is being responsible for having a anti aging properties or not now lastly uh, the cell death assays can also be done in this model organism excessive cell death is one of the key features which is associated with the uh, with the different neurological disorders in humans drosophila have conserved cell death signaling pathway which is very similar to humans the drosophila that is why it is being used as a model organism for apoptosis and uh, to study the apoptosis and its re relative genes study of the cell death by using the drosophila gives the vital knowledge about the normal development and the mutant type in the neuro uh, degenerative models of drosophila fly shows the rough eye phenotype due to the excessive cell death using the specific markers of the cell death such as acridin orange staining can uh, help us to examine the cell death <coughs> uh, cell death in flies so we can do the acridin orange in the third instar larva stage uh, we can stain their eyes and look for the rough eye patch uh, in the larva lastly the resources for drosophila now uh, because it is a very very important model organism it has been serving a experimental model in life sciences for about a decade so it is very important to have a public domain for the information for drosophila genome and its uh, repository of mutants first uh, first resource of the drosophila which is widely used uh, is flybase this is the website of the flybase flybase is a online repository of genetic and molecular data of drosophila especially drosophila menarchaeus because it is the most commonly used uh, uh, fly as a model organism the data type includes the information about if you see here it has lots of uh, um, tabs and every tab is going to have a data about the information about the gene names their synonyms linkage and cytological maps nucleotide sequence with their protein sequence if it is uh, it is transcribing gene or a protein coding gene orthologs or homologs present in other organism available mutant stocks and uh, it is also having the extensive hyperlink to many other databases for the bioinformatic analysis so it is a very very good online repository you can uh, explore now uh, uh, this online repository has uh, all types of mutants th morgan has initiated a publication on drosophila which gives the information every information of the drosophila which is uh, being developed worldwide that publication is known as drosophila information service now uh, that is a kind of a newspaper or a newsletter uh, annual newsletter which was uh, informal communication between the fly researchers across the globe now we know that it is being widely used as a model system especially in the case of neurogenerative disorders so with the with the advancement in the computer infrastructure now everything is online and that is why this fly base is being developed 
in 1992 nih funded the flyways project with this objective of the dh movement that drosophila should be information about the drosophila should be globally available with the continued expansion the flyways has become a major online source for the comprehensive information about the genes genetics genomics and many other features of the drosophila another is drosophila flyway so if you see here and there would be an other other features of the flyways one of the flyways is drosophila flyway it is a journal which is published by genetics society of america and it is periodically publishing historical prospects about the significant developments in the fly genetics in 2015 this journal started publishing the comprehensive review articles spanning the breadth of biology genetics genomics and evolution of drosophila as a part of encyclopedic flyway now others are uh, other uh, resources which are available in the flyways also that is the bloomington drosophila stock center now free sharing of the fly with their mutant has been always a common practice since the inception of a drosophila genetics in the fly room by the mogul as the user and the repertoire of the mutant stock increases need of a stock center is is there which could serve a repository for diverse stock and provide them to desired user when fit bridges Strawen established a Drosophila stock center at California Institute of Technology. This collection was moved later to Indiana University Bloomington in 1986, which has now become the major source of Drosophila stocks. Beside Bloomington Drosophila stock center, there are many other stock centers in different countries. Even India do have. contributors of this little star in the biological sciences are not limited to genetics this model has been extensively used in discipline of evolutionary biology developmental biology cell biology neurobiology behavioral biology immunology etc many investigator across the globe are using drosophila as a robust model for research in the diverse area in the biomedical domain i hope you have learned a lot of things about the drosophila from this lecture i hope it is helpful also thank you very much